Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's virtual book discussion of Coptic Culture and Community, um, edited by Dr. Mariam Ayed. This is the book I have here. Um, we're live streaming uh, on our Facebook page, the American University in Cairo Press. And um, today's talk is going to be about one hour long. And we will have room for Q&A at the end. So make sure if you want to ask questions to type them in the Q&A box so we don't miss them. And if you're watching on Facebook, just type them in the comment section. I will ask them on your behalf. Um, so our book today is uh, Coptic Culture and uh, Community, Daily Lives, Changing Times, edited by Dr. Mali Mayed. And it's a volume that brings together leading experts from a range of disciplines to examine aspects of the daily life experiences, daily lived experiences of Egypt's Coptic Christians minority from late antiquity to the present. And it reveals the humanity of the Coptic tradition, giving a granular depth to how Copts lived their lives through and because of their faith for 2000 years. I'll not discuss it more. I'll leave that to Dr. Mayim. But you can order your copy now from uh, major bookstores worldwide and online book retailers. And in Egypt, you can find it at AUC bookstores, DYM bookstores, and so forth. And I'll be adding purchasing links uh, to the chat box for your ease of ordering. And today, we're quite delighted to have with us um, Dr. Mariam Ayed, the book editor, uh, who is an associate professor of Egyptology at the American University in Cairo. And in 2020-2021, she was a visiting associate professor of women's study and Near Eastern religions and a research associate of Harvard Divinity School's women's studies in the religion program. Uh, she's the author of uh, God's Wife, God's Servant, The God's Wife of Amun, and the editor of three volumes on uh, Coptic culture, as you can see on the screen, including studies in Coptic culture, transmission, and interaction. We're also very delighted to have with us uh, Dr. Caroline Ramsey, who is a feminist, anti-racist, ethnomusicologist, who focuses on uh, Egyptian Christian popular music in Egypt and a growing diaspora in the US and Canada. Specifically, she examines how orthodox music culture shapes the Coptic community uh, gendered subjectivities and the use of virtual technologies to challenge traditional understanding of holy belonging, sexuality, and faith. We're also very delighted to have with us today uh, Dr. Uh, Helen Musa, who has authored numerous articles and books in the areas of education, social work, international development, refugee women, and Coptic art and icons. She was Dean of School of Social Work in Haley Selassie University in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And she has been on the teaching faculty at AUC in Cairo and is currently a curator at the Coptic Museum of Canada in Toronto. Please join me in welcoming our book editor and contributors. And now I'll leave the floor to Dr. Mary Mayer. Thank you, Suzanne, for making this event happen and for the lovely introduction. Thank you, everybody, for showing up and taking time out of your busy lives to come and um, be part of this panel discussion on this newly released book on Coptic culture and community. Um, this is actually the third volume um, that I've edited with the very broad concept of Coptic culture. What is culture? Uh, what do we mean by Coptic? This is not something that is easy to answer. Uh, nor can it be encapsulated in just one or two sentences. Uh, we can come up with definitions that are simplistic, but life is much more complicated than this. And um, along with the other book published by AUC Press in 2016 um, that looked at patterns of transmission and interaction and the Coptic role in, in the transmission of knowledge in various ways, the Initial volume that dealt, that attempted to, de to deal with this very broad topic came out in 2012 and was simply titled Coptic Culture, Past, Present, and Future. The running theme in all three books is an attempt to understand what it meant to be Coptic in centuries past and what does it mean to be a productive member of the community in this day and age, whether in Egypt or abroad. Um, there are no definitive answers here, but instead each of the three volumes includes um, case studies that look at in depth at one aspect of cultural expression, whether it's music, as we'll hear from Carolyn in a minute, or whether it's women's rhetoric, as my chapter in that latest book uh, proposes to do, 
or whether it's art in various forms as we'll hear from Helen in a moment. So cultural expression is very wide, but culture is not just about artistic expression. Um, in this volume, we also have uh, contributions that deal with um, religious identities um, in the oasis, for example, as manifest in um, monumental architecture, big churches in a very, very remote community, um, in a community that corresponds in Coptic, because Coptic is a very local language. So although it employed Greek letters, it's the native language, it demonstrates a lot of um, dialects because it's the vernacular of the inhabitants of Egypt um, through very many centuries. Um, we have also studies that look more generally at uh, what did it mean to be a proper Christian person, uh, a very in-depth study into Clement and his views on, on um, food, attire, uh, sex, proper, proper behavior and decorum. Um, and we have a contribution, a contribution on the role of bishops and advocates for orthodoxy and also advocates for the local community in centuries past, not in contemporary culture. So this is a very long uh, lasting tradition in Egyptian, Christian, in Coptic community. Uh, the idea of the religious figure as a representative um, on behalf of the voiceless, not necessarily on behalf of the powerful and the rich. Um, and uh, there's also a contribution here about Ghayar or the attire that was imposed on the uh, Christian community of Egypt in the 13th century by order of the ruling uh, elite. So it's a very wide ranging A very wide ranging selection of topics, but one of the main objectives I wanted to do in this volume, but also in the other two, is to demonstrate that Coptic culture, unlike its more ancient predecessor, is not to be relegated just to a museum culture. It's a living tradition. So in all of the three volumes, there's always one or two or three or more contributions about the lived contemporary experience of the Christian community of Egypt, people who identify themselves as Coptic, whether Copts in the diaspora or Copts uh, producing poetry in this day and age in Coptic, or as we'll hear from Carolyn, um, Coptic women leading praise and worship sessions. So one of my pet peeves actually is that a lot of my colleagues who are non, not Egyptian and not Coptic, and even among the Egyptian, colleagues, there's a tendency to think of Coptic culture as something that is of the past, that is monumental, that, whose place is either tourist sites or museums, rather than the fact that people in this day and age often chant words that they cannot read necessarily in this very ancient tongue, which is actually, because I teach at the AUC, is an extension of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs just transcribed in a different script but it's the same language, it's all Egyptian. In fact, the word Coptic comes from Egyptus, Greek, or Egypt. So yes, we are all Egyptian, but the identification as Coptic increasingly has become a religious identification, not just a national identification. Um, there's just a lot to be said about uh, uh, why these volumes came about, and I really need to acknowledge everyone who participated in the series, in, a series of four different symposia held in the Coptic Orthodox Church Center in Stevenage under the auspices of Archbishop Angelos, um, who was then just a bishop um, of the youth with the aim of bringing scholarship to the community, really. And the freedom that that forum allowed us to transgress academic departmental silos where an ethnomusicologist may not necessarily collaborate with an art historian or with an Egyptologist, right? So even though we're all concerned with the Coptic experience, but it's in different ways and in various centuries. So I was very blessed, in fact, to be given the opportunity to um, transgress these academic silos because it's 
sometimes we are trained to be very super focused on not just one time period, but one aspect of that time period, and even there, one type of material culture within that time period uh, or discipline. Um, so I'm very grateful for the opportunity to um, be able to really demonstrate through the scholarship of these wonderful people that Coptic tradition is very much a living tradition. And on that note, I will turn it over to uh, Helen Musa, who will tell us a little bit about um, one of her two chapters in this volume. Thank you, Miriam. Um, I uh, wanted to start by making a brief point on the significance of this book. Um, and uh, you have outlined it uh, very clearly, but I'd like to repeat uh, it again from another perspective. The book is much more than my two chapters uh, as a museum curator. Um, the topics, the 14 chapters, uh, cover a range of topics, as Mariam pointed out, on Coptic culture. Um, and its importance to me, it's the wide range of interdisciplinary uh, uh, topic, uh, approaches and arguments uh, the authors take to interpret Coptic culture of the past and today. Uh, and it provides very challenging insights uh, that weave together the tapestry of the conferences theme that we attended. Um, uh, and we, uh, uh, on ordinary lives and changing times in the Coptic uh, culture and community. Most conferences uh, I go to uh, will have these papers dispersed under different uh, uh, academic disciplines or methodologies or a specialized conference. And rarely is there an interaction across disciplines alone. And uh, I'd like to emphasize that using this book is very important to see it holistically. As an introduction to uh, my chapter, I need to situate the Coptic Museum of Canada and myself. Uh, the Coptic Museum in Canada uh, was uh, the vision and creation of Abuna Osmoros, the first priest to minister to the Copts in North America, who established the first uh, North American pari parish in Toronto in 1964. And in 1977, St. Mark's Coptic Church in Scarborough, the suburb of Toronto. While he was ministering uh, to the Copts across Canada and several years across the US, uh, he collected artifacts for his vision of a museum. In 1996, the museum was inaugurated by His Holiness Pope Shenouda III, and to this day, it is located in a gallery and offices on the second floor of the church. Father Marcus's vision was that the diversity of Coptic art in the museum's collection would reflect the continuity, changes, adaptations of Coptic art in Egypt's history, despite the fact uh, that many cultures rule countries, uh, the country after the fall of the ancient Egyptian uh, uh, dynasties. Today, the collection in our museum spans uh, 1352 BC to 223 AD, uh, and includes uh, uh, Coptic art and the art of the Copts, I'd like to emphasize, created in Egypt and in the diaspora. Uh, the most significant uh, collection to this day are the six biblical themes uh, by Marguerite Nahla that Abuna Moros initially collected. And uh, I, I will be speaking uh, to the chapter uh, I wrote for, for the 1977 uh, conference um, that she was on, on Marguerite Nahla as a painter of mosaic the mosaic of daily life. Um, in Coptic culture. The artifacts in our museum, I'd like to point out, are not all liturgical. Uh, I came on uh, as a volunteer interpreter in 2000, and my educational background is sociological. Um, and I had to get a qualifying degree as a, in museum studies before I could 
take on the responsibility of the curator in uh, uh, 2005. Margaret Nachler was born in uh, Alexandria in 1908 and died in 1977. She was part of a movement of Egyptian artists in the 1920s during and after the revolution seeking independence from Britain. And these artists sought to create art that was rooted in Egyptian culture, both in style and essence, as against Western high culture. Her formal education, art education, started in Egypt and later was in Paris during the Impressionist and Expressionist uh, period. In 1975, at the celebrations of the first International Women's Day in Cairo, there was an exhibition of 10 Egyptian women artists. She was one of them, and uh, uh, she was named the leading Egyptian woman artist by the then Minister of Culture. One of my priorities as a curator is not only researching about the collection, uh, but in particularly about the artists and what she or he perceives about their art. This, is not, this not only gives a value to the collection, but is critical for our educational role as a museum and learning about uh, the social context of art or how art can be seen as text uh, in imagery form that can provide knowledge about the social context. It was uh, painted or drawn or created. There's little or no documentation of early Coptic artists. Even, and even a book published by uh, about a famous iconographer in the 18th century, uh, Johanna El Armani, um, the author of the book not only was not able to gather information about the artist's perception on art or what influenced him to create icons in a certain way, which is a big gap. At our museum, we're trying to make amends with this in, with, uh, as we relate to contemporary Coptic artists. In 2009, we published uh, a book on Marguerite Nahla, um, that, uh, who was by then uh, long uh, since passed away. Uh, in researching for this book, I, I uh, had to uh, find information of, about her from family, friends, and colleagues, and collected as much material uh, that was accessible, um, such as catalog on her exhibition, art critics reviews, etc. This led to this book that we titled Margaret Nahla's Legacy to Modern Egyptian Art. And uh, archival information and research continues beyond this uh, publication. Uh, the book places Marguerite Nahla and, uh, and her development as an artist in the context of it, Egypt's history and the art and art in her period. There is a chapter interpreting the six biblical scenes in our collection, another chapter on icons she painted in a church in Zamalek, uh, uh, depicting 12 scenes that she titled Women in the Life of Christ. Car Carolyn Ramsey also happened to be in Toronto when we were putting together this book. And she made a very interesting comment that the colors in Marguerite Nahla's paintings sing. Um, this was actually a phrase that an art critic used to describe Marguerite Nahla's work in the 1950s. I then asked Marguerite, uh, Carolyn to write a chapter in the book uh, on that theme as an ethnomusicologist. This is a very unique opportunity uh, uh, that we had to analyze visual art from a different discipline such as ethnomusicology. I think it enriches both our disciplines to have that interaction. And there should be more of this type of collaboration. Mariam's book uh, actually invites such a cross analysis. The last section of the Nahla book has photos of 75 can canvases I was able to photograph. 
Uh, she was a prolific, prolific painter, devoting her whole life to art. Unlike her peers, she only took a part-time paid job uh, for one year, uh, teaching art in a women's art institute. She depended entirely on the, uh, the sales of her artwork. While a number of her paintings were rural and popular areas, such as marketplaces, red date harvesting, or wheat thrash, uh, thrashing in a farm, unlike many of her peers, she didn't limit herself to a particular social uh, um, uh, class uh, or uh, region of the country. She was able, uh, uh, yeah, sorry here. She was able to communicate with her brush the other side of uh, uh, social events and narratives. And that's uh, was a distinctive qualification of her artwork. For example, she has a canvas that I showed that depicts the active movement of people in the stock exchange in Cairo. And the date shows that it was during uh, uh, the intense pursuit of uh, uh, profits after the world, world War II. Two paintings uh, I showed showed uh, the impact of on Nubian villages and villages uh, villagers uh, after the construction of the Aswan Dam. And another one uh, is on the return of refugees in Porsaid after the Six Day War. Uh, her aim in her aim uh, art reviews uh, that quoted her as saying that she not only wanted to relate uh, an anecdote such as um, date uh, harvesting in this picture on your screen, but she also wanted to provoke an idea uh, about ordinary lives and changing arts. And her work as um, a, a, an art of a copt is uh, very significant and recognized rather widely uh, to this day as a contribution to modern e Egyptian art in her period. Thank you. Carolyn, do you, would you like to tell us about your chapter and your research project, please? I'd love to. Uh, first, I want to say it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank both Mariam Ayed and the AUC Press for inviting me to this roundtable. And I want to thank Susan's labors in um, the, the getting us together, sort of stewarding us through the technology and the hiccups and glitches of uh, meeting in a space where we can meet from all around the world. And so I just appreciate those labors there. Um, as I was putting together my notes, just to think about this chapter um, by way of autoethnography. So one of the methodologies that's um, rising in my discipline is to sort of think about this chapter as part of a larger research arc, both for myself, but to, to also sort of forecast some of the kind of questions that um, that I think are a part of this arc. And so in many ways, I write here, it's a poetic return to be sitting at this panel with both Helen Musa and with Mariam Ayed. Um, I really began my doctoral work at Helen Musa's table. I often say this, asking questions about Arabic non-liturgical genres of teratil and teranim. So the, you know, thinking about uh, these non-liturgical songs that my grandmother sang and thinking critically about the politics of divestment in Coptic identity politics. What does it mean, my dissertation asked, for the Coptic community to disengage with a lived belonging as a way to contest civic exclusions in Egypt, in a new diaspora homeland in Canada, and to sing about a heavenly belonging instead? And of course, at Helen's table, many of my questions were about, you know, sort of by way of autoethnography, it was about belonging. How do I belong to my own community? How do I belong as a, you know, a Kuwaiti-born Egyptian-Canadian uh, American? And so in these spaces, I was trying to thread many of the, the kind of questions that had really initially started at my grandmother's table. So, you know, 
I um I always say that much of my career just by steps really started at Tita's table making kahk and piti for for Eid and singing Taratil and Taranim. And she helped to put the Arabic back into my mouth. And in between, you know, she would use the words afokil khat or take apart the Arabic letters. But it was by way of her that I learned so much about her own autobiography and particularly thinking about her quotidian life. So this was sort of the ways in which, you know, my dissertation started and propelled me um, to the paper that I gave at the symposium that we shared together, Mariam. Um, I came back to this project as an assistant professor at the time after I attended the international symposium, um, if I recall correctly, on Coptic culture, past, present and future, I think it was all the way back in 2016. And I was still working on a project thinking critically about the Rere Muftah collection of liturgical music at the Library of Congress. It is one of the largest collections outside of Egypt of Coptic liturgical music both recordings, transcriptions, letters, I mean really a very rich collection that represented our Coptic music culture and I was really deeply thrilled to work with it. Um, but I noticed, much in the same way in my own dissertation, I noticed a gap of women's voices in the largest collection of Coptic liturgical music, not just at the Library of Congress, but when I went to the Egyptian Patriarchal Archives, when I went to missionary archives, um, and often despite or contrasting, you know, sort of the language written in letters where women, mothers, khudem, and teachers are often cited as great teachers and supporters of Coptic music culture. So coming to the symposium was my really first sort of stab at asking the question like, why are women's voices often effaced in the literature scholarship about Coptic music? Uh, and importantly, I started to notice that even grassroots archives that I deeply admired being created online um, also often effaced women's participation and labors, despite being experts as well. So when I wrote this chapter, I was really, and I'm always uh, to your point, Helen, I'm thinking of the kind of interdisciplinary potentials of thinking about you know, Marguerite Nechla's labors in terms of the art and the ways in which Teretil and Terenim deeply shaped her worldview and deeply shaped the worldview of the viewers who are looking at this, uh, at her art. Um, and so I started to use this project um, and what becomes a chapter in this book as a real stepping stone to think about Coptic music as a gendered space. So what does it mean to learn about uh, our questions of belonging and questions of our place in the world and in the afterlife through the music that we sing collectively as a community? and particularly the music that sort of enters our bodies through our ears. So this was where um, I always sort of cite this chapter as a kind of germane space in which I initially start thinking about these questions. Um, and I was inspired to think about Coptic women's migrations to online spaces to think about the ways in which mirroring the larger Coptic community, they were also contesting the ways in which they wanted to belong to their community. So this chapter here inspired one project for me called Coptic Women uh, Sing To, um, where women migrated to online spaces to contest their own sonic exclusions from Coptic liturgical spaces, but at the same time also contest the exclusions of Western feminist movements that often excluded women of faith, uh, racialized and immigrant women among others. So this project became really deeply reparative, picking up from this arc of the chapter that I put into this book. And it helped me to shift my methodology um, as a scholar, really think of um, thinking broadly as part of a larger kind of ac activist effort to propel not just Coptic feminist movements forward, but to create these spaces, um, often what I've uh, borrowed from the literature from other scholars called digital diasporas. So spaces where um, Mina Ibrahim calls misfit Copts, others people say unchurched Copts, others say spiritual Copts who are asking questions about belonging within, straddling their community, sometimes on the outside of their community, um, and have deferred to online spaces. So I want to maybe, what I'll do is I'll share my screen for a little bit to show you both of these uh, public digital projects that have sort of started off of this chapter and the ways in which it really connects all together. So I'll share my screen and hopefully my sound too. 
it says here for some reason i can't share my sound maybe i won't show you i'll just show you the screen itself so what you're looking at this is the instagram account called coptic women sing too so it's um i used my chapter in this book as a kind of platform um, and it was curated for the American Religious Sound Project. It was funded both by Michigan State University and Ohio State University. And before the pandemic hit, it was meant to follow the ways in which women often deferred to online spaces to sing Coptic music, and often to sing Coptic music in the capacities in which they couldn't sing in offline spaces. So you'll see here we have, um, you know, hashtag Coptic chats about Coptic chants. So this is one series uh, and it follows the kind of cultural context there. So it brings the chapter that I wrote in the AUC book to life in a kind of digitized space. And you can see the lessons of a particular hymn here. Um, and more importantly, you can see Teremim Tuesdays. So people invited, I invited folks to come in with Teremim Tuesdays. And then finally interviews with activists um, or I would say, you know, community leaders, community uh, khudam or servants in their church communities, teachers of Coptic Alhan. And these were a lot of fun to make. Um, I might even share a brave blooper about the first, <laughs> the first interview that we held here to show you just how the scholarship really starts as a book chapter and then slowly comes to life as it, as it migrates into other spaces. Um, Perhaps I'll do that first. I'll show you this. So this was my first interview with the ways in which I changed my methodology, moving critically from um, a kind of traditional ethnography to a much more collaborative and I would say indigenous methodology that drew on colleagues that drew on anyone who wanted to collaborate as partners in this research. So here I'm working with Dr. Mariam Youssef, um, the person who started Coptic ecclesiastical choirs in the United States in LA, California, and she was the first person I was going to interview. And you can see we were still learning how to work out our methodology of both radical friendshiping and collaboration in this project. Um, so bear with us. Oh, I wonder if the sound will work. Uh, you let me know if you can hear it. Okay. Hi, Maria. Can you hear it? Hi, how um, are you? Good, how are you? Um, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce you all to Maria Youssef, uh, a women and gender studies professor teaching at Cerritos College and California State University, Long Beach. Her research focuses on issues of gender, sexuality, and survival, especially in persecuted and I'm going to stop. <laughs> I just got too nervous. <laughs> I'm going to try that one more time and we're going to stop the video and start again. Oh, no, not my video. <laughs> <laughs> we should have a bloopers reel. Where did the record button go? So you can see it was a, a lot of fun, but I think it caught our trepidation to talk openly and candidly about Coptic women's experiences, singing often liturgical music in a deeply gendered space. So this project, finally, uh, the last thing I'll show, and you know, the space of gratitude I hold for this chapter is the way it inspired me to think beyond the, the kind of traditional methodologies first, and then to think quickly about how to engage people in uh, relationship with the chapter itself. So I put together this uh, digital diaspora, a first called Coptic Women Sing Too, and then a a kind of public um, digital exhibit that will walk you through, particularly as someone who may not be on the inside of Coptic music as culture, to actually walk through all of the kinds of conversations that people have had online in each of these bubbles. So, you know, I, I'll share the links. I know I've shared the links here. I appreciate that, Susan, for sharing it in the chat. I invite you to explore it and particularly to read it in partnership with the chapter um, in, in this book here. I've got it on my desk already sort of proudly sitting at my desk. Um, but it, it'll bring the music to life in the same way I think that um, looking at Marguerite Nachla's work and putting it in collaboration with Teretil and Terenim illustrates that what we hear and what we sing is a big part of making us who we are. 
And I think particularly looking at Coptic music culture, um, both closely and intimately, we're asking bigger questions much bigger than beyond the sound itself. The questions are typically gentle, like, how do you belong? How do you feel that you belong? How would you like to belong? How do you imagine to belong as both a Copt? And then you add the complexities of what it means to be a diaspora, um, a diaspora Copt. So these are the kinds of questions that I raise in this chapter and um, was very much happy to do it in camaraderie with both Helen and Mariam, particularly at the early stages uh, of this work. So thank you both uh, for uh, receiving me first at your tables uh, and helping me set up uh, my own tables as I go along too. So, so I'll thank you all that very much. That's what I've got so far, yeah. Well, Carolyn, it's so interesting and inspiring to see how your project has taken off since um, writing this chapter, which I have to admit has been sitting on my desk for years and also Helen's. Thank you both for your patience. Um, one issue that I encountered, because this volume actually includes papers from two different symposia, one held in 2015 and the other held in 2017. And with the other, the first one was about um, regular people, daily life issues, from which we have the subtitle Daily Lives Changing Times. While the second, the, the last one in 2017 was about um, uh, advocacy and freedom and somehow the two themes merged and made for this volume which had 14 um, which has 14 contributions but the initial stages of putting the book together were very challenging uh, initially with the first symposium um, I had nine papers and people were reluctant to publish a book with only nine papers so I shopped it around to several publishers. And then when the second wave of papers arrived, I saw connections that were unintentional. So one paper was delivered in 2015 by one scholar working in Germany. Another paper was delivered in 2017 by a scholar in California, but both have the themes of poverty. I'm referring to Samuel Mahawad, of course, of Germany and, and Ash Malika. So they came together finally, because again, if the concern is daily life, and micro history, then there's a lot to be said about issues of poverty and power and persecution and resilience and survival and identity. And all the themes are intermeshed. One thing I intentionally did not do in the volume was to lump all the papers that deal with women in one section. So I have a chapter on, on a, a particular letter that is very well published and well studied. Um, in which I examined the rhetorical devices that this woman applied when addressing the bishop. It's uh, almost a traditional uh, study of, you know, text-based, object-based, uh, definitely within the mainstream of my field. But instead of thinking, okay, uh, Mar Margit Nachla is a woman artist, Faro uh, is, is dealing with uh, female singers, I'm dealing with a woman, let's lump all women together. I thought it was more conducive to see how the woman I, that I studied was approaching the bishop so that he may intervene on her behalf with the authorities so that she may not get evicted from her home. And that letter is from uh, the second decade of the seventh century. We're able to actually place it in a real point in time, 619 to 629, because of the reference there to the Persian conquest of Egypt, which occurred shortly before the Arab conquest 10 years later. Um, so it's sandwiched between chapters that deal with power and Episcopalian authority and the role of bishops as community advocates, while also a chapter by Samuel Mawa talks about how Shiuta of Atwika discussed the issue of poverty and and uh, flagrant flamboyance of wealth, you know, uh, showing off wealth, and how that was really very anti-Christian, also a very tradition, traditional in the sense that it's it's a first edition of this manuscript, it's a linguistic study and a philological study. But I thought that the broader issues, the broader categories are, would enable us to see how women fit in a larger scheme of a network, power network, uh, network of, of people, rather than just looking at 
okay, all the women should belong together because gender is a factor that moves history forward, but it's not the only factor. So I really appreciate uh, Carolyn's remarks now about this idea of a deeply gendered space that where women are trying to, to make some, some headway. And I should also mention something I should have mentioned in my introduction is that this was not intended to be a panel of women by women about women. It just so happened that uh, these two wonderful contributors made themselves available at this hour on this day months ago so that we can actually hold this event. I approached more panelists and more contributors that I wanted to have as panelists, but it just shows how much um, of a commitment uh, you both have, which I thank you for, to this project. Um, the other point I, I really want to mention is whether we're talking about Marguerite Nakhla or women chanters or this woman who wrote a very impassionate plea to the bishop, it's very important when we're doing history in general. Um, is, it's very important to avoid overgeneralized statements about what is a cult, who's a cult. It depends on when and where and in what circumstances and on social class and on gender and access to power and access to wealth. So the advantage of doing microhistory and very focused and narrow studies, which I dare say the different chapters of this book attempt to do, is that it's like a mosaic, um, like these collages of pictures that are wonderful that came out of the 2011 uprising, where each mosaic is its own picture, but together they may form a very different and bigger picture uh, that enable us to understand what it meant to be a Coptic person, it, a minority member, because Copts throughout their history were a minority. Even when they were the majority of the population, they were never in power. So it's just a lot of, of questions that I think are best left open-ended for now, as each one of us tries to grapple with these questions and reach our own answers. Um, there is, of course, always a one or two sentence answer to every question, but how truthful would that answer be and how accurate? This is something that uh, I think as, as, as scholars, we need to avoid these dogmatic statements, these overarching statements. Um, and just to you know, plug in my chapter very briefly, um, rather than selecting um, a manuscript or a text that hasn't been published before, I selected a very well-known letter in which an unnamed widow implores the bishop to intercede on, on her behalf so that she would not be evicted from her home. And we're not sure why she needs to be evicted, what kind of thing caused her to owe some people some money, and now these people want to evict her. And that caused me to think of that led me to two things. One, um, her rhetorical devices, because the letter is known for its repetition. It's like like an onion, concentric circles. Okay, what she says at the outset, she repeats at the end, but the core, the crux of the matter, the fact that she's being evicted, is mentioned only once and really in the heart of the letter. And then around that central issue, she goes into big circles about how he's such a great person and what I found is that she alternates between us statements and me statements. So who, you are the bishop who intercedes before all the people before God and, and then who intercedes before me and for me. Um, so that was very, very smart. And then in her letter also, she refrains from actually stating what she needs to happen. She doesn't tell the bishop the desired outcome of of her of her plea. She doesn't really tell him what she wants him to do. She leaves it up to his discretion. And that's a very smart move because maybe he'll do more than she expects. She doesn't want to limit him, but also maybe she doesn't want her plea to be rejected by asking for too much. So the stuff that is left unsaid is equally significant as is what is said. Um, and I could go on for hours on this one short text, but I think my point is that even published works need to be examined beyond the line-by-line -line translation to see 
why these people chose to address other particular people about particular issues in a particular manner, which is done in other time periods and in other cultures, but not necessarily in Coptic culture or in Coptic studies. Which of course leads to the very big issue, what are what is Coptic studies? When do you stop? Is it contemporary or is it at 641 or when Arabization was completed, whenever that was? And yeah, so these are scholarly questions and interdisciplinary questions that people ask and don't often answer. And when they do answer, the answers are often very limiting and very prohibitive and not conducive to more research or to interdisciplinary research. Um, I could talk on uh, on this for hours, but I think, Helen, we need to hear about Peter Fahouri and why you were interested in his work uh, before we all run out of time here. Uh, to just thanks, uh, Mariam, but just to add a, a point, uh, your uh, point on the mosaic, uh, Actually, as I'm an amateur mosaicist, and even every tile in a mosaic is distinctive, but they are united together in the image that's created. Okay. Uh, when Mariam invited me to give a paper at the 2017 uh, Coptic Culture Conference on Accuracy, uh, Activism, and Freedom, uh, I chose to give a paper on icons in this uh, series by Victor Fahouri. Uh, this time it's in our museum's collection. One of uh, the major cultural icons, uh, outcomes of the so-called Arab uh, Spring in 25 January 2011 in Egypt was that it became a catalyst to artistic expression. Visual arts such as graffiti burst out, so to speak, from nowhere on pavements, on roofs, and even camp, uh, tanks. Several uh, publications have uh, documented these artwork, uh, artworks. While many of the artists may have been Christian, this art was generally secular in its representation. And in contrast, there was a profusion of Christian lyrics such as Taratil, which by the way, Ma uh, Karen Ramsey has also researched and published. Fahouri's contribution in this movement is however unique in the field, field of Coptic iconography, because he created not just one icon, but a series of 10 icons between 2011 and 2017, in which he made it his vocation to respond in the language of icons to a sequence of contemporary events in the life of the church in Egypt, beginning with the popular uprising in 2011. This in itself was an innovation and in stark contrast to icons in, Copt in the Coptic Orthodox Church that represent saints and ma uh, martyrs predominantly from the Roman period. While each of his icons may very well have been in a church, Victor Fahouri wanted them to be in an educational together and as an entity, not separate. The museum eventually acquired all 10 of the icons and we documented his interpretation uh, of each of the icons in a catalog um, that we have in the museum uh, that I titled Coptic Icons in a New Life. It's in French and in English as a true Canadian publication. According to Fahouri, anyone can interpret an icon as he or she sees it or relates to it. But the biblical interpretation and the imagery he sought to express a spiritual me message is what was important to him. Icons for him, he stressed, are both sacred and devotional art. And he emphasized that. In fact, he titled several icons uh, with the biblical verse and often uses more than one verse to reinforce the underlying spiritual message he sought to convey. For example, the first icon, um, this is in the first icon on the board, uh, he titled, he, uh, he could have given the title the January 25th, 2011 revolution, which a journalist might have done. But Fahouri instead titled it, Blessed is Egypt, my people, 
a verse from Isaiah 19, 25, which makes all the difference on the main imagery uh, and the focus of his art. The catalog provides for art historians and scholars information about how Fahuri sought the Bible for his inspiration to create each icon, the historical forces that shaped them, the key features that determined his particular style, and the symbols he used to translate biblical texts and meaning in imagery uh, and the message he sought to convey by that. Because uh, Fahuri was responding to lived experiences when uh, feelings of pain were raw, still raw, his message could have been used and said to have been pastoral in its effort to heal and find hope in God's love and the reassurance of God's protection of the church uh, and her faithful in the midst of changing uh, situations and turmoil in some context. In the context of the conference, this paper was pre presented and published. I took a sociological or anthropological approach to my analysis by po uh, positing that the icons and the message Fahuri conveyed were also social statements of the conscious and spiritual ways cops can or should respond. Also, the ancient Egyptian imagery he used to reinforce the identity of cops as Egypt Egyptians and the historical roots of the church at the time uh, that identity was threatened, uh, to me, was uh, our social statements. Rather than discuss the icons chronologically, as in the catalog, I grouped them under four headings that located moments uh, of events that happened in the history in this, ten, uh, in this period um, and the location where cops and the church were impacted. Icons, as any visual art, are texts. Uh, they may not be in letters, but they're in imagery. Uh, and the imagery needs to be read in the language, uh, in that language, uh, to be able to contribute to our under understanding of who created them, how and why they were created. So on a final note on the book we are reviewing today, it actually invites us not only to selectively read individual chapters, I think we've all stressed that, but especially to engage in the interaction between chapters towards a greater understanding of how daily lives and practices and changes uh, in historical moments have uh, uh, reflect the culture and the identity of cops. For example, I think it would be very interesting to engage in a dialogue with Fahuri's approach uh, and Carol's and Mary, uh, Mariam's chapters with Ihab Halil's historical and psychosocial approach to social change. If I were teaching a course in religion and social change or in Coptic studies, which I, by the way, uh, Mariam interpret as an interdisciplinary discipline, um, I would use this textbook uh, as uh, one of the main teaching uh, uh, text for it. Um, the bibliography in each chapter also provide a wealth of reference, references. And already at our museum, we not only have this book in our reference library, but I've used uh, a number of articles, none of those that we discussed today, uh, uh, as a reference for our current uh, uh, special location at the museum. And I thank you all for listening and for Mariam uh, for inviting me and, and also participating with Carol once again. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. You know, I found your chapter on the Victor Fox icons very moving as I did your initial presentation at the conference and thank you for remembering the proper full title of that symposium I, I forget activism I forgot activism advocacy advocacy and freedom uh, 
Um, so um, I'm very thankful to the panelists for the, making the time today and also yesterday to um, to talk about the book. And thank you for very your very nice and complimentary things that you said about it. I would be delighted if people would use it as a textbook, but it was really a work of passion. And it was many, many, many years in the making, very long uh, gestation period, but I'm glad that it's out. I hope that it will be a springboard for other people to take the studies presented here and, and run with them, um, either as an approach or um, maybe they'll inspire people to pursue more aspects of Coptic culture rather than just the monuments and the monasteries and the bishops and the people of power. Um, which is a general trend in, more broadly speaking, in religious studies um, and in the history of religion, to look at how regular people experience religion, express their religious faith and, and their practices. And on that note, I invite Suzanne to let us know if we have any questions. We'd be happy to answer them. Um, there's a more generic question about um, I'm not sure who should answer this one, but if any of you noticed how social media, if any, impacted Coptic Christians in the diaspora with their sense of belonging, and I, I could see that uh, Dr. Carlin showed us like Instagram, but if you want to elaborate more on that, if it's being used more or less in longing sure. the identity. I think social media has had a significant impact on conversations of Coptic uh, belonging. Uh, particularly, I would say, I haven't been able to access the Egyptian spaces, so the Arabic language speaking spaces, as much as my focus on English language speaking spaces. And I would say, you know, the first time I heard um, an interlocutor or someone I was working with come back to me and say, you know, Abuna mentioned some of these, uh, some of these Instagram accounts at the youth meeting. Um, it really sort of hit me that, you know, word sort of travels from the phone onto off, you know, in real life and then back. And I would say that in many ways, it both presents a real kind of potential in terms of creating alternative avenues for people to have candid, frank, sometimes very difficult conversations and debates <laughs> about what it means to belong as a Copt, as an Orthodox Copt, uh, you know, other spaces for Catholic and Protestant Copts, and particularly those who intersect their identities in other ways. And I also think it's presented a challenge to the church institution. I think um, the Coptic Church is one of the most mediated institutions in the Middle East, um, with um, a really over like a, a fantastic reach in terms of being able to access Coptic music any time of the day, a live liturgy at any time of the day. But I think having Instagram accounts uh, often kind of a grassroots space in which people are initiating conversations that may not be um, as welcomed in more religious spaces has decentered some of, you know, to Mariam's point, has decentered some of the spaces of power a little bit. Um, this isn't just a phenomenon that hop happens in the Coptic Orthodox Church. This is happening everywhere. Um, but I would say in the in the diaspora community, particularly, um, it is notable the ways in which people interweave their lives on and offline. I think as Copts, uh, we've straddled spaces before and social media is sort of the next space uh, where Copts are making themselves at home and crafting and creating new homes and new soundscapes. Um, I hope that answers your question very quickly um, there. Yeah, we received another one in the Q&A. Uh... Uh, Mariam, if you, if you want me to read it, I can read it out loud if you want. Um, Andy Winter is asking there, she's curious about, or he, I'm sorry, curious about uh, to hear more about how we can read paintings as, the, as if they were texts. Uh, I think the statement was made by Dr. Helen. Uh, this statement really interested me. Thanks. We actually have workshops. Uh... Uh, to help people do that. Uh, uh, one of the terms used with Coptic icons is uh, an artist is writing an icon. Painting is the technique. And because the uh, author, uh, the artist is uh, using the Bible or the tradition of the church or the documents of the church to interpret a certain 
the life of a saint or a certain event uh, in painting. So uh, if they're writing an icon, we have to be able to read it. Um, and this is why it's also important to know what the artist was thinking, which was very difficult, is very difficult for older icons and uh, uh, the work we're doing. So uh, one of the workshops we give, uh, for instance, are with Victor Fahuri's icons. Uh, we divide the group in uh, 10 groups and each group has one of his icons uh, with his interpretation. And then we ask people what in the images he's used reflects his interpretation. And that is how they read it. And then uh, they uh, unpack it that way uh, on that. So, and Victor Fahuri's icons are just resplendent, full of, full of imagery uh, that needs to be unpacked. That's why he says you can interpret them the way you like, but this is the way, uh, the, the way I have used them and, and placed them on that, yeah. They're really uh, fun workshops. I had one with uh, um, uh, young uh, university graduates and uh, um, and one of the fellows, he said, I really never could understand icons and their meaning. Uh, and I didn't realize there was so much, much to them. Of course, Victor's icons are, are uh, have plenty of imagery to unpack and read, and it's a good one. But we do it with other icons as well on that. Thank you, Helen. This is amazing. Um, um, we, we have one question of, about the book and its different chapters, the 14 different topics. And it, the question is, what other areas related to Coptic culture and lives that still need to be highlighted? And what are the future projects you are working on? Um, I can tell you that um, uh, in in this book, uh, Ehab Khalil, who's here, hi Ehab, has talked about the future of, of the Coptic tradition in the diaspora, especially as people engage with centuries old traditions in a new settings, in a new setting, in constantly changing settings as well. And he has a very stern warning not to throw the baby with the bathwater in his paper. But it's a very insightful paper from someone who's very involved in um, lay leadership within the Coptic community in Canada. And I think that this conversation between the contemporary, the modern, and the ancient, and the medieval is really essential to try and understand how did we get here, and who we are, and where to go from here. Um, for my part, I'm, I'm setting aside Coptic culture for a while. Um, I have a couple of other projects on the back burner that I need to get out uh, soonish. And then maybe, I don't know, maybe in five years, I'll come back to Coptic culture. I'm not quite sure. Um, Alan and Carl, would you like to add about oh, projects? Sure, I'm happy to. I had forecast in my own work that at the moment I'm working on Coptic digital diasporas. So thinking about um, the intersection of online spaces and IRL spaces um, and real life spaces, mostly because I'm, you know, Coptic identity politics are deeply dynamic. And to add the kind of diaspora lens to it, I think much research really needs to still happen in diaspora settings. What happens as cops through different immigrant and then first, second and third gen experiences. Um, there are also, I think, in the kind of narrative about belonging, there are many underrepresented uh, Coptic members in the community. And I think there are important conversations to be had about boundaries and borders of Copticity and who belongs to Copticity. And so this is, again, um, a space where I find myself doing a lot of work. I hang out a lot on Instagram. I hang out a lot um, having conversations on WhatsApp threads, uh, often on SoundCloud, really pursuing the ways in which um, in the same way that COVID-19, you know, sort of propelled people to manifest their life straddling online and offline spaces, I'm interested in the ways that Copts carry the soundscapes of the church with them wherever they go. 
even if sometimes that means divesting or exiting from a church community, what happens um, to cops who are no longer guided by that kind of institutional community, but in turn are creating these really interesting virtual alternate kin uh, and often alternate kin online. So that's where I find myself, uh, where my head is sort of spending a lot of its time these days. Helen, what about you? What are your future projects? What are you working on? And your microphone is muted. I, yeah, they... uh, I have a lot on my plate just with keeping the museum going and the artifacts. Uh, uh, and uh, actually, we're having a growing trend of, trend of university students uh, wanting to do res their research uh, masters or PhD thesis uh, on one of our artifacts. Uh, at this stage, it's mainly our, the manuscripts in our collection, but we've had one working on our uh, uh, icons of uh, Mark, uh, Badur Latif and Yusuf Nassif and uh, Isaac Fanous for his master's thesis. So they, they keep me uh, on my toes. Yeah. Um, Helen, um... We can take this off uh, line as well, but Vidur and Yusuf are kind of related to my dad. So if you need to know more about their daily life, I can connect you to someone. Um, oh. A question to you uh, from our Q&A um, is uh, from Mary Therese Abdel Masih, um, who seems to think or has been told that many icon painters, Egyptian Coptic icon painters were trained in Russia and she wants to know if there are any connections between painters in Russia and Eastern Europe and Egyptian Coptic painters, and uh, whether that practice of attending workshops in Russia is still going on. I personally, from knowing Badur and, and Yusuf and going to visit them as a young child with my dad, I know that they are of the Isaac Penus, um, tradition and school, but I have not heard of any Egyptians training in Russia because the in my view the Russian style is very is very different but that since that question was addressed to you perhaps you would like to address it well Badur and Yosef um, really went to more to Italy than anywhere else but they they uh, were much more focused in finding a, a Coptic iconography through uh, learning more about Coptic folk art like Marguerite Nahla was actually uh, Badur's teacher at the Institute for a number of years. Um, the one person who was influenced uh, and learned under Russian iconography was Isaac Fanous. He didn't go to Russia, but he studied under the leading uh, Russian iconographer who happened to be in Paris uh, on that. But uh, I don't, I haven't heard of cops going to Russia there. Uh, to learn. Uh, in early history, um, in the 18th and 17th century, um, they, they sometimes went to Italy and Venice in particular and uh, have been influenced there. We have an icon in the museum uh, that is dated 1771 that is clearly influenced by Venetian uh, Catholic uh, art. But uh, this was a Coptic Catholic icon as a, uh, on that. But I haven't heard of a current uh, or that except for Isaac Fanousis. Uh, but he, he went to Paris, not to uh, there. Yeah. I need to talk to you more about Badur and Yusuf because uh, uh, it is the strength of our museum because the St. Mark's Coptic Church has 41 of their icons. Um, and uh, it is part of our museum's exposure to take people to this church and learn about uh, Coptic iconography, particularly through the eyes and the brush of uh, Badur and Yusuf, or as Yusuf used to say, there are four eyes that could see more than two eyes on that. Uh, so it's it's a very rich church uh, to do that. Yeah, we see the whole building is actually a, a historical cultural building uh, for people to visit. Yeah, yeah, we would be happy to connect you to one of uh, 
her nieces. So yeah. another question to you, Helen, about the Coptic Museum and what a treasure it is. And uh, PB Farag Mahail would like to know uh, if there are any plans to make it more accessible to the general public outside of Toronto, perhaps through a website that might share digital images of all the holdings with educational information and or through webinars like these that share these valuable pieces of art uh, in more depth, perhaps even hearing from artists who are still alive. We actually have a website uh, and you can see uh, uh, under the uh, link on collections, you can see a wide range of art. We do have uh, also uh, social media, Facebook and um, in, uh, uh, Instagram. And uh, frankly, there are more people outside of Toronto that visit our museum than Torontonians or even our immediate physical neighbors. So you just need to call us and uh, uh, we'd be glad to set up an appointment for people to come. It is by appointment because it's part of a church building and uh, the access uh, to the museum is through the church. Yeah. But... We'll, I have far more people coming from outside of uh, Toronto, or even Scarborough or Markham, uh, visiting the museum. Oh, they yeah. come from as far as Egypt and uh, um, Europe. Uh, I've had Japanese people come who are interested in Coptic art, so uh, it is accessible. I've shared the link in the chat box if anyone wants to check it out. To Pardon me? I've shared the link to the Coptic Museum uh, and okay, so yeah. the chat yeah. box. Yeah, thank you. And you can yeah. always email us. Um, I see that we're going over time. Perhaps one more question um, um, uh, from an ano anonymous attendee. I don't know how that could happen, but there is such a thing uh, despite the registrations. So, um, and uh, someone unnamed would like to know more about Coptic identity, specifically women's Coptic identity and their potential marginalization for their PhD pieces, and whether there are any resources that I may or any of us can, may recommend. Um, I, for a, I would tell you there's nothing really about Coptic women, uh, ancient, medieval, or present that has been published really. Um, there's a few works on the desert, desert mothers, um, but they're often considered Greek and not Coptic somehow. Um, um, I've been looking at women in literature and there are a few hagiographies. Uh, I mean, there's no Coptic literature um, outside of hagiographies that we know of really. Um, but maybe Caro would have something else to say about contemporary Egyptian uh, Coptic women. I'm talking about ancient. Yeah, I there are so to your point, Mariam, there there aren't very much publications on Coptic women yet. There are a few. I mean, I just have to take a moment and sort of do the ethnographic observation that the anonymous question comes about women as sort of indexing some of the ambivalence about asking about that and why there isn't as much scholarship written because the stakes can be high researching Coptic women in the Orthodox community, particularly in contemporary contexts. One book I would recommend about contemporary experiences is one by Mariam Youssef, my collaborative, I call her my intellectual bestie and bestie among many things, but she wrote a book called uh, Gender Paradigms in Theologies of Survival, sent, uh, Silenced to Survive. And there is one chapter in there about Coptic women and it's titled, and I highly recommend it, The Church of the Martyrs and the Second Sex, Gender and Diaspora Coptic Theology. Phoebe Armanios is also a historian and has written a number of works about um, Coptic women in film. Uh, Coptic Hollywood is, so she writes about Saint Hagiographies and the representation and the impact of that representation on you know, audiences who are watching it and the ways in which Coptic women's comportment is sort of uh, constructed in these film contexts. So I would recommend some of her work as well. Um, and I do see one question, if I may just have even 30 seconds, I see a question from Facebook that asked me, and I'm really glad someone asked me, I sort of dropped it and hoped someone would, but it says here, can you speak, uh, you spoke about how your methodology um, indigenized as you moved uh, forward in your research, can you speak more to this process? Um, uh, what does or could an indigenous methodology sort of teach us about, um, and I, the question sort of shifted a little bit more. 
Um, so the work that I'm basing on is uh, one on Kathleen Absalon. She writes, she's an Anishinaabe scholar here in Canada in which uh, we think deeply critically about how settler colonialism in Canada impacted indigenous ways of knowing. Uh, the book is called How We Come to Know Indigenous Research Methodologies. And for her, um, Absalon writes that indigenous or indigenous methodology is a deeply engaging indigenous worldviews in methodology. Reminding researchers that this knowledge can be found within depends on relational accountability and a relationship with the land and particularly contextualizing encounter within a colonial context. So, so thinking about, she uses the word research and hyphens it to emphasize the act of looking again, to reckon with the disruption, amnesia, contexts of loss and research traumas of colonialism. I restore myself, she writes, to restore myself and Egyptian indigenous Copts sing their stories. So in many ways, that's how indigenous research methodologies is mirrored in the work that I do here. Uh, so I highly recommend this work as well. And then to the last question here, yep, I saw it. Phoebe Armanios was mentioned in the chat. Uh, she was the one who wrote about Coptic Hollywood and the films, um, just for the anonymous uh, person who asked that question about resources. So I appreciate that question very much. You can tell I got a little bit excited, but there are a lot of good books out there. Um, people in the chat are asking for the full title of the book you mentioned, where uh, the Church of the Martyrs and the Second Sex. Is sure. The title into the chat for everybody. I can put it in the chat. Yeah. So it's called Gendered Paradigms in Theologies of Survival by Mariam Youssef. And I'll put that in the chat here. Right. And again, thank you all for being part of this panel um, and for. Uh, attending the panel, Suzanne, if you have any yes. uh, announcements or, or concluding remarks, please. Well, I just want to say, first of all, thank you so much, Dr. Mariam, Dr. Carlin, and Dr. Helen, for this very insightful book discussion and for making it possible, taking the time of your day and actually planning months ahead just to do this and for sharing the knowledge. That's what we always aim for. And also, I want to thank everyone who joined us today from all over the world on Zoom and Facebook. Uh, we loved having you with us. And as a reminder, the book is out and it's available worldwide if you want to order it from major bookstores and online book retailers. And if you visit acpress.com, you'll find it on one of the main books on the sliders on the homepage. And you'll find also purchasing links so you can order it. And uh, if you want to rewatch or share the recording of this talk you'll find it uh, right after on our facebook page AUC press and uh, soon on our youtube channel as well once again thank you um all dr mariam and dr carlin and dr helen for your time and uh, if you want to say final words i'll leave the floor to you i just want to say thank you all for having me this was a real pleasure the pleasure was all ours Oh, Dr. Helen, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> I'd like to also thank everybody and especially the panelists uh, for collaborating on this. Thank you, Susan, for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Helen. And Mariam. Thank well, you. thank you all for making this happen. And, and for all the attendees, thank you for making uh, the time to attend this discussion and go buy the book. I think you will not be disappointed. <laughs> good night or goodbye, everybody. It's 9, 9.20 in Cairo, uh, mid-afternoon in Toronto, and who knows yeah. what in Eastern and Western Europe. All right, see you all later. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.